Dave Antonucci. Dave is a civil engineer who's been here, I'm going to say 37, but now it's probably 38. 38, 38. 38 years. See, i got to change my memory here. Um, 38 years at Lake Tahoe, and um, formerly or currently on the Tahoe Resource Conservation District formerly. Board, formerly, and um, thank goodness, <laughs> yeah, tough times there. Yeah. Um, and so um, let's give him a warm welcome. This is Dave Antonucci. Well, thank you. I uh, see a few familiar faces out here. And it's good to see you again. I'm going to, I've got about 40 minutes now where I'm going to give you a quick overview of Lake Tahoe. We're going to touch on the cultural and environmental history, and then I'm going to hit just a few of the most frequently asked questions that people have about the lake uh, that you'll probably get and hopefully dispel some myths too. I always like to start off by talking about uh, Mark Twain coming to Lake Tahoe because he's probably the most famous person that ever came to Lake Tahoe. He came actually over the mountains just east of here and uh, came down into Crystal Bay, rode across Crystal Bay and uh, tried to stick a timber claim near uh, Tahoe Vista. He let his campfire get out of control so it burned up the, the, the timber. Although if, I think if he was here today he would say that that was a prescribed burn <laughs> and not a, an accidental forest fire. So, uh, but he, he wrote about it, if you've read his book, Roughing It, then you know that there's a couple chapters there in which he writes about Lake Tahoe, he's very fond of it, and kind of opened Lake Tahoe up to the rest of the world. So, I'll start off with uh, the environmental and, uh, and cultural history, because the, the history of Lake Tahoe is the history of its environment and its people, and how the two have interacted together over time. And it all begins with people, if you will, and I'm, I'm fast forwarding ahead now. I know you're gonna get a geology lecture that's gonna explain how the lake got here. So we're gonna start with the lake being here 150 or so or 1400 years ago. And the people that lived here, um, the first visitors, if you will, were the Washoe tribe that uh, camped around the lake. They came up here in the summer. Uh, they caught fish. Their, uh, the fish they caught was a Lahontan cutthroat trout, which was native to Lake Tahoe has since uh, considered extirpated, which is not quite extinct, but uh, it means it no longer exists in Lake Tahoe as a natural uh, reproducing population. They also gathered herbs and, and other plant foods around the lake, and then before winter moved everything back down to the Carson Valley and the lower valleys uh, of western Nevada. It was important that the, the Washoe felt that Lake Tahoe had a, a special place in their life. It was not just a, a sustainer of their bodies through providing uh, most of their food source, but it also sustained their spirit. And so they had a strong spiritual <coughs> attachment to Lake Tahoe, and there were a lot of uh, tribal traditions and uh, legends that uh, were developed around Lake Tahoe. Obviously, when Lake Tahoe began to be populated by Euro-Americans 150 or so years ago, the Washoes were evicted, and by the turn of the 20th century, they had all but ceased to exist at Lake Tahoe and been confined to um, tribal reservations in the lower valleys. They do have a couple properties up here at Lake Tahoe, but the one thing they left us with is the name Tahoe. Tahoe is a, uh, derived from a Washoe phrase that describes Lake Tahoe, Da'aaga, and we heard that, us white people heard it, Da'aaga, Tahoe? Tahoe meant rhymes with Washoe, and that's kind of how it got started. The old name of the lake was Bigler, but that was changed uh, to Tahoe in 1861, and it's been known as Tahoe ever since, but it wasn't until 1845, or 1945, that uh, the state of California made it official. Tahoe laid pretty much uh, undisturbed uh, for a lot of years until the late 1860s. Uh, Silver was discovered in 1859 around the Comstock Lode. By 1861, almost all the timber between Virginia City and Lake Tahoe uh, had been either consumed or claimed, and the, the mines were growing, they needed timber, and so big time lumbering moved into the Tahoe Basin. And that would have been in the early 1860s with the establishment of mills. And it got progressively more extensive over time and this quote that you see here, it was in the Territorial Enterprise, it was written by a, a contemporary of Mark Twain's that he worked with, a guy named Dan DeQuill, who 
said that the, the Comstock load was the tomb of the forest of Tahoe, meaning that the, the forest of Tahoe had been sawed, cut into lumber, and then delivered to the mines for their use. You have to give it to them for uh, creativity on how to get that wood there because it's quite a distance. So wood was cut around the lake and then uh, it was put uh, on either a, a railroad or it was hauled by oxen or just dragged across the forest floor. Sometimes it was put into log chutes, but it was all brought down to the lake, wherever they were logging around the lake. And then it was loaded into booms that you see here, log, logging rafts, and then there were steamers on the lake that towed the, uh, the booms over to the mill complexes that were on the east shore of the lake, and there was one right here in Incline Village. That's this one up here. And then, but the main mill complex was at Glenbrook. There were two mills there that operated uh, pretty much 24 hours a day beginning in the 1870s until the lumber was exhausted by the mid-1890s. From there, and this is Glenbrook that you see here with the mills in full production. From there, I was put back on a train and taken up to the ridge of the Carson Range, uh, Spooner Summit, seven and a quarter miles on a narrow gauge railway. And then from there, it was offloaded. And here you can see the timbers that were used to shore up the mines. From there, it was put into a flume and traveled all the way down uh, water from Spooner Lake all the way down to Carson City. The flume and lumber yard was located about where the Costco is in Carson City in that area, that general area. That was the end of the, uh, the flume. But from there, they had still had to get the lumber to Virginia City. So um, it was put on a train and then hauled all the way to uh, Virginia City um, for use in the mines and in the uh, buildings and also as fuel wood. It's also, wood was also used to construct the Transcontinental Railway. About two thirds of the lumber that was cut at Lake Tahoe went through Glenbrook and most of that ended up in the mines. The other one third or so went through the mill here at Incline Village and their main customer was the Central Pacific. And so it's really a misnomer to say that all of the trees were cut and used in the lumber in the, in the mines uh, because a great deal of it was used to construct the Transcontinental Railway. Well, with all these people, you needed to do something about agriculture and being able to have Nevada grow its own food to sustain its own people. And so uh, a dam was under construction for other reasons in Tahoe City. And in 1915, it was condemned and taken by the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, who had been established in 1903 to develop water supplies in the West to allow people to actually farm desert land and grow food and settle the West. So the idea was the federal government would develop the water systems and provide the water, and then Americans would move West and settle on the land and uh, develop family farms and produce food for the United States. So the, the lake was raised unnaturally about six feet. So the, the maximum elevation is uh, 6229.1, which would be near the top, not the top of the dam, but within a couple feet of the top of the dam. And the low water is 6223, and that's where water ceases to flow from Lake Tahoe into the Truckee River, although it can go lower than that and has gone lower than that in the past. So the way the water system worked here was uh, there was a, they used the Truckee River, they dammed up Lake Tahoe, and then there was a a dam built on the Truckee River below what is now Reno called Derby Dam, you go by it on Highway 80, which diverted the water through the Truckee Canal to another dam on the Carson River uh, called the Haunt Reservoir. And there the water uh, was stored up. Of course, uh, you can see what happened is uh, if you're one of the Paiutes living here at Pyramid Lake, you got no more water. And so Pyramid Lake started to dry up and it led to considerable amount of litigation over uh, water rights. Don't have near enough time to go into that. But interestingly enough, while the trees were being cut, entrepreneurs were setting up luxury hotels already. In fact, there was a luxury hotel at South Lake Tahoe that predates the timber period. So uh, people were coming up to Lake Tahoe for the health uh, benefits that they thought they would get, fresh air, high altitude, clean water, all these things that they thought would cure whatever ailed them. Um, and these are some of the hotels that sprang up around the lake. Uh, it was a very exclusive 
uh, place to come to. You couldn't drive here, obviously, no cars. It wasn't easy to get here on a horse. So how did you get here um, in the early 20th century after the logging boom was over and all the trees had been cut, leaving only about 5% of the forest, and so the forest was in recovery? How would you get here? And this was before cars became popular. Well, the way you got here was you would take the Central Pacific Line to Truckee. And then in Truckee, you would get on a narrow gauge railway, the same narrow gauge railway that was used to haul the logs from Glenbrook just a few years earlier up to Spooner Summit was relocated over here by the same family that owned the mills and they established a resort hotel in Tahoe City called the Tahoe Tavern. If you weren't staying there and you needed to get to one of the other hotels, what you did then is you got on one of the company steamers and this one you see here is the steamer Tahoe which is the most famous of all of them but there were others that encircled the lake and the steamer then would take you around the lake to, and drop you off wherever you were staying. It would also carry mail, deliver freight, pick up passengers, and it would do an entire uh, circling of the lake in about eight hours. And it would do this every day. And this is how you got around at Lake Tahoe. You could, there were still roads. In fact, uh, even in the early 20th century, there was a road around Lake Tahoe, except from Glenbrook uh, to Incline Village, this one spot here. Uh, but by 1925, uh, the road was complete and cars were becoming more popular. So this method of transportation died in 1943. The rails were ripped up for, for scrap and um, recycled and the trains were sent to museums, one of which is down at the museum in uh, Carson City at the train museum. The other one, the other uh, engine is in uh, Nevada City on display. Well, while you were here, what did you do? Well, mainly people from Virginia City, and, but mostly San Francisco came here. And it wasn't so important to come to Lake Tahoe. It was more important to be seen at Lake Tahoe and have it reported back in the newspapers where you were. So people in San Francisco would come up in the summer to escape the cold and the fog uh, of San Francisco. And then uh, people in Virginia City would come up to Tahoe to get out of the heat. So they all had their reasons here. But it was all a life of leisure. You might sit out on the veranda, meet with your friends from San Francisco. Um, and you might, if you were really brave, go wading like these people did, although you wouldn't go swimming. And the reason you would not go swimming is because you believed, like everybody else, it was impossible to float in Lake Tahoe. <laughs> True. It wasn't until 1915 that that myth became dispelled and a person proved that you could swim in Lake Tahoe. So prior to that, and these people here, you see, they're not swimming, they're just standing on the bottom. They wouldn't dare take their feet off the bottom because you would, you would sink for sure. But that was a popular myth. They thought it was because of the altitude that the water was less dense, and therefore uh, you couldn't float. So that, that's a pretty funny story. A lot of people came up here for health reasons. Uh, they had what was called consumption, which we call today tuberculosis. And they come up here and felt that the dry, clean, fresh air, high altitude, would cure whatever ailed them, and so they, they would also come here. In fact, Mark Twain wrote about coming up here once to uh, cure a cold. Well, following World War II, uh, the place really started to grow. We have returning GIs, a uh, roaring economy in California, um, and more uh, hotel, motel facilities began to be built. The basin was now accessible in the 50s by car. People would come up in car camp and it was poised now to grow. And one of the things that happened, but didn't necessarily cause the growth, was the 1960 Winter Olympics that were held in Squaw Valley and on the west shore of Lake Tahoe. Uh, a lot of people say the Olympics caused the growth. That's not true. It's, a, it's actually a fallacy called post hoc ergo prompter hoc, meaning because of this, that, meaning most people think because two things happen about the same time, they're somehow related, that one thing caused another. When in fact what was happening is there was a very strong economy in California, there was a high population in California, people had more leisure time, salaries and wages were high, they had young families, the economy was just right for the development of resort real estate. They now had the time and the economic ability to invest in resort real estate and that was the response of, that happened at Lake Tahoe is there was a high demand 
for people to build their cabin in the woods, and it could be done fairly cheaply. You could buy a lot for a couple thousand, and for less than 10,000 bucks, you could get a two-bedroom cabin built on a lot in, uh, at somewhere at Lake Tahoe. Well, of course, with this high demand for real resort real estate led to um, quite a bit of um, activity that was not necessarily in the best interest of the lake. Part of that, it was obviously fueled by greed and avarice, but also it was fueled by a lack of knowledge, that they didn't know <coughs> what they were doing. And so we had things like this uh, that you'll see right here, which is the construction of Tahoe Keys in, a, in what is perhaps was once the largest freshwater marsh in the, in the Sierra Nevada. They did not understand the value of, of a marsh and how the ecology of Lake Tahoe worked and how important its surrounding environment was. Just as they thought in the late 1800s that a standing forest of trees on the hillside was a waste of a resource. They thought that a marsh and having a swamp, as they called it, was a waste. No one understood the, the value that it provided in protecting Lake Tahoe. And then we also had development like this that you would never see today, highly undesirable, highly visual, visible from the lake. Uh, all this led to uh, a great amount of concern about what to do about the lake. The counties, which were the only entities that had any ability to control growth, were wholly overwhelmed and unqualified to deal with the onslaught of growth management. And in fact, they had a little bit of an incentive to have growth here because it would increase their tax base. Remember, in the case of California, the major population areas in the counties of El Dorado and Placer were on the other side of the hill. And the same it was true, I think, in Nevada and Washoe County. The main population center was in Reno, not up here. In the case of uh, California, the, there's a lot of population now up at Tahoe, and at one time the Tahoe population succeeded the populations on the west side, but that since reversed itself. Anyway, there was a, a major outcry uh, to try to control growth. Politicians came up with the idea of bringing the two states together under a compact, which is allowed under the U.S. Constitution, where two more states can enter into a compact that uh, usually it's done for allocating water rights, but it may also be done to um, control land use or to jointly manage some other resource that's of mutual interest to the two states. So uh, a compact was drafted between the two states and it was signed into the law by the two governors of the states, who the governor of California at the time was a guy named Ronald Reagan, and the governor of Nevada was a guy named Paul Axel. So if you know either of those po politicians, you know uh, their background and their, their philosophy as, as conservatives. They were able to, to transcend that and actually signed in the most sweeping environmental control legislation that had been approved to date. Uh, it was subsequently ratified by the Congress and then signed into law by Richard Nixon, uh, who was the President of the United States in 1969, but not for much longer, uh, as we all know. So uh, that's kind of the history. It was subsequently revised in 1980 because the first compact was a compromise. It had some flaws in it. And it was subsequently revised in 1980, and now it probably has swung back too much the other way, and there's a, a lot of pressure now to revise it and go back the other way. Say what you want about TRPA, Tahoe Regional Planning Agency, which was the primary product of the Tahoe Regional Planning Compact, which was a set up this by state agency. This was the growth that was projected to occur if you allowed everybody to build out according to the way the counties had, had it zoned. And so what you see is that there would have been a peak population of about 600,000 people here during, say, uh, the first week of August. But this is what actually happened as a result of TRPA. They actually cut the potential population growth in half by a process called downzoning. And then other uh, techniques were brought into play, such as buying up land later and um, other things that were done in terms of transfer of development that. So today, the projected maximum pop peak population is only about 300,000, about half of what it would have been if we had just stood by and, and done as what one planner described as a city of a million with a big hole in the middle. That's how it was described. 
And um, so you can look back and say there has been some accomplishment, even if people are still <laughs> in disagreement about where, where we're headed right now. Uh, I get a lot of questions about Lake Tahoe. Uh, I've written a little booklet called Natural World of Lake Tahoe. Do they have it in there? Uh, they don't have it in their yeah. hand yet. They don't have it yet. Okay, but they will. They will. So it, uh, I just made it my purpose in life to give people the real facts about Lake Tahoe because there is so much erroneous information out there on the uh, web now. But even before the web, it was in the newspapers and magazines, just bad information. These are the true dimensions of Lake Tahoe. Uh, 21.2 miles long, if you measure it, sort of like a rectangle, and slightly less than 12 miles wide at its, at its widest point. But the, the biggest diagonal, though, and that's why you hear 22 miles, is actually uh, from Incline Village down to Camp Richardson. That's the biggest diameter, if you will, or diagonal measure of the lake. By far, the, the most misquoted number about Lake Tahoe is the amount of shoreline. And I, I did a, uh, a Google search and I found almost 20,000 mentions of the distance of the shoreline length that was, was wrong on the web. And it's actually 75 miles, not 72 miles, as you will pick up any magazine, any newspaper and read. Well, where does that number come from? That number comes from the road around the lake. It's 71.8 miles and they round it off 72 and some genius thought well gee if the roads only 72 miles the lake can't be more than 72 miles right wrong because you can see here as you know like here at state line point you know the road cuts across here but look where the shoreline goes so there's twice as much shoreline as there is road right across state line point so 75 miles over 75 miles is the shoreline of Lake Tahoe and uh, not the 72 miles how deep is the lake? They usually get that one right. If we were to take Lake Tahoe, saw it in half, and, and take a look at the side, uh, we'd see a lake with an average depth of a little over a thousand feet, and we could drop the Empire State Building in there and uh, have it still covered by almost 200 feet of water. Uh, so the depth is 1,645 feet, maximum depth, at high water, and that's measured right out here in Crystal Bay, which is the deepest part of the lake. The shallowest part of the lake is here, so the bottom kind of slopes this way. It's all deeper here, and that's because you'll learn why when the geologist talks. So consider that Carson City, Nevada, is a little over 100 feet above the bottom of Lake Tahoe. So next time you're in Carson City, think about Lake Tahoe and think about the deepest part of Lake Tahoe. It's still 100 feet or more below you. Yeah, real quick question. I just wondered if the maximum depth, is that is the natural rim or at the top of the dam? Uh, top of the dam is what's reported. That's what's recognized now as the maximum depth of Lake Tahoe, which would be 6229.1 to whatever the absolute elevation is at the bottom. So. This is how Lake Tahoe compares in depth to uh, other lakes in the world. It uh, is the 11th deepest lake in the world. I don't have all 11 of them up there, but I just have some that are up there for an example. The deepest lake in the world is Lake Baikal. It's over a mile deep. It's one place where the Russians have got his beat. So we'll give him that. And lake Baikal is a huge lake. It's also the largest lake in the world. It holds 20% of the world's unfrozen fresh water. And then, but there are other lakes like in uh, Africa uh, and Asia mainly. Uh, and then in Canada that are uh, of comparable depth. Crater Lake up in Oregon is a little bit deeper. Um, I have to count Crater Lake even though it's not considered a large lake. You have to be um, over 500 square miles. Um, I think or forget how to do 500 square miles of watershed uh, in order to qualify as a large lake and Crater Lake doesn't. But uh, among large lakes, all lakes, uh, of a significant size, Lake Tahoe is 11th, so you can see that how the depth compares there. How pure is the lake? Here's another one I love, is uh, people say that Lake Tahoe is 99.7% pure. Where does that number come from? Well, that comes from ivory soap. <laughs> commercial, where they said ivory soap is 99.7% pure. I won't get into the details of this, but raw sewage is purer than 99.7% pure water. So how pure is Lake Tahoe? Well, 
try 99.994% <coughs> pure water, which means about 60 parts per million of dissolved minerals in the water out of uh, a million parts is, is what's in Lake Tahoe. If you take, if this pool was full of Lake Tahoe water and you dried it all out, how much residue would be left? About three quarters of a teaspoon. Not that much. That's what you would see collected at the bottom. So pure is Lake Tahoe. And it's, uh, that purity really hasn't changed much. Chemically it's changed quite a bit, but in terms of the, of the gross overall measure of dissolved mineral matter, that really hasn't changed much over the years. And there's some reasons for that. Uh, another question people get is, why is Tahoe so blue? And uh, even if you go to the website of none other than the League to Save Lake Tahoe, they will tell you Tahoe is so blue because it reflects the sky. And the sky is blue. And that is not true. That is not true. And uh, they know it, but they don't fix it. And I don't know why. But Lake Tahoe really has different colors, but those colors are determined by a unique property of water that when sunlight penetrates into deep, clear water like Lake Tahoe, certain colors in the spectrum are filtered out within a few feet. So like the red, uh, you can't see it too well because of the color correction from the projector, but the green, uh, the yellow, um, they're filtered out in the first 20 or 30 feet of water. And so that's why on South Shore, when you look out over the shallows, or if you're, ne or if you're near the lake and there's a, like a shallow bench that goes out and the water looks green, that's not because there's green algae growing there, it's because what you're seeing is green light, which is the predominant light color at that depth being bounced back to your eyes. Then as you get out deeper, past 75 feet of depth, then the, even the green light is absorbed by the uh, water molecules, and what's left is blue or indigo light, and that's why you see this Lake Tahoe has this characteristic blue color, same for Crater Lake, and as you get out really deep, even the blue light disappears and all you see is the indigo light. That's why some people, when they're on boats and they're out and the sun is in the right position, the, the middle of Lake Tahoe looks like it's cobalt colored. It's bluer than blue, and that's what you're seeing is the indigo light that colored light being bounced back. All the other blue light, most of it, has already been absorbed by the molecules. Mark Twain saw this and wrote about it. And uh, he, he mentioned that Lake Tahoe was one of the bluest lakes he had ever seen. And uh, mentioned seeing the indigo color out in the middle of the lake. Uh, so 75 feet then is pretty much it. And uh, that's where you get that blue color. It has nothing to do with the color of the sky. Although, under certain conditions, if the lake is calm, the sun is in the right position, the clouds are there, you will get a reflection off the lake because water will reflect light. The surface will reflect light. So I've seen the lake all kinds of colors, pink, orange, uh, based it on sunsets or sunrises. Uh, and you have too if you've been here any amount of time. So you are at that point, you are getting obviously a reflection. The water isn't turning red. Uh, it, it's just a reflection of the sky under the right <coughs> conditions, but under normal circumstances what you're seeing is blue light and indigo colored light out in the deep, uh, deep sections. Here you can see, like here is an unusual uh, condition I caught in Rubicon Bay, it's actually turquoise. It wasn't green, it was just the bottom and the lighting was just right, that there was no green. You can see a little bit of green right up here, but the main color going out here was turquoise, which you see very rarely um, in the lake. So I was able to catch it that one day. It turned out uh, it was a cold, clear day in the spring and the wind was blowing and the atmosphere was perfectly clear. So there was more light, a higher spectrum of light getting through that wasn't being affected by particles in the atmosphere. And I think that's why we got this turquoise color that we don't normally see. So, but uh, Lake Tahoe um, is not the highest large lake in the world, it's the second highest. And Lake Titicaca in South America would be the highest large lake in the world. But there are no other lakes that are large that are higher. There are lakes that are a lot smaller that are higher. We know this in Desolation Valley. But it, what's, that's one of the things that makes Lake Tahoe so unusual is its depth, its colors, its clarity, and then its high altitude for a lake this size. It's very, very rare. Uh, 
how much water is in this lake uh, is a good question. And the answer is a lot. If you were to <laughs> dump out Lake Tahoe onto the state of California, you could cover it up to almost 15 inches of, of water over if you could spread it out evenly over the state. Some people say that would be a good idea. And you can pull things off, particularly in Sacramento. Uh, but just give you an idea of the volume of the water uh, here in the lake. It, you wouldn't think that looking at the lake, but you've got to remember how deep it is and the tremendous volume. So now we have an empty lake. What do we do with it? Well, we've got to fill it back up. Well, get ready to wait because it's going to take hundreds of years to fill that lake back up again. Maybe six or seven hundred years of consecutive average winters to refill that lake back up to where it was after we dumped it all out. This little graphic shows you how the, the volume of Lake Tahoe compares to, to other lakes in the world. Um, in terms of volume, it's not really that big. And you can see that all the Great Lakes uh, in the United States and Canada um, are bigger than Lake Tahoe. And you can see how big Lake Baikal is compared to uh, the Great Lakes. Um, but then even Lake Erie, which is a shallow Great Lake, is, is larger than Tahoe, and Tahoe is quite a bit larger than Crater Lake. Just to give you an idea, well, where does all this water go? Um, what most people do not realize is that two-thirds of the water that flows into the Lake Tahoe is lost, uh, start, excuse me, start with one-third of the water only goes through the dam, so what happens to the other two-thirds? It is lost mainly to evaporation uh, from the lake. So out of uh, four and a half or five feet a year of total water that would flow into the lake from snow melt, only about a foot and a half is, re is actually able to be retained and discharged through the gates at, at the outlet of Lake Tahoe. About three feet a year will uh, evaporate off the lake. So with weather like we're having now, if the wind picks up, it's going to be evaporating uh, over a tenth of an inch a day, uh, day in, day out. So the average evaporation is about a tenth of an inch a day, but it really varies. In the summer, it's much more than that. In the winter, of course, it's much less. So another question is, uh, how cold is Lake Tahoe, and does Lake Tahoe freeze? And we know, notwithstanding what this picture shows, this is another lucky shot I got. This is on the west shore, where an unusual condition uh, in which there was calm, lake had been very calm and we had very cold uh, conditions allowed the near shore waters to freeze. But Lake Tahoe itself does not freeze over and never has in the kind of climate that we have. How does a lake freeze? Well, it's just another unusual property of water that for a lake to freeze, all the water has to be chilled down to 39 degrees. And when it reaches 39 degrees, it reaches maximum density. So when that happens, that water at maximum density has to, it sinks to the bottom. And so water at the top that maybe is 40 or 41 degrees, it gets cold, it reaches 39 degrees, it doesn't sit there and keep going, it sinks down, down. And so for a lake to freeze, the whole lake has to go top to bottom, 39 degrees. Then the top layers will begin to freeze as it goes from 39 to 32, and ice will form on the top. And the situation with Lake Tahoe is that the volume of water is so great in terms of its ability to store heat and, and then lose heat slowly through winter, and our winters are not so cold that they don't suck enough heat out of Lake Tahoe, that really what happens, maybe the bottom of the lake will reach 41 degrees and the top will hit 42. Uh, out in the middle of the lake, away from the shore where it might be calm and, and it might freeze. And then what happens is it starts, we hit spring. It starts to warm up again. So the lake never gets anywhere near 39 degrees top to bottom. Another question that comes up is uh, how old is Lake Tahoe? Because it's so pure, people think, well, it must be a very young lake. There hasn't been a lot of time for nature to uh, conduct a natural aging of a lake that's called eutrophication, in which all lakes go through this process, in which the watersheds gradually uh, erode down into the lake, cause the lake to begin to fill up with sediment, and the ultimate outcome of most lakes is a swamp or a meadow. Um, 
In the case of Lake Tahoe, though, it's very unusual in that it is one of the oldest lakes in the world. The oldest lakes, if you will, are, are listed right there. These are the ones that are up in Asia. Um, they're 20 to 25 million years old. The youngest lakes are less than 5 million years old. They've been formed more recently. But in the middle, we have between 20 and 10 million years old. Uh, this group of lakes, of which Lake Tahoe is one, and uh, strangely enough, not too far from here, another lake, Tule Lake on the California-Oregon border is of comparable age. So Lake Tahoe is somewhere in the range of 10 to 20 million years old. It's a good question to ask the geologist when he gets here, is uh, how they date Lake Tahoe and uh, when they uh, think it was first formed. It, it started out as a much smaller lake uh, and then its size was increased by different geologic processes, but I won't spoil the ending on that for you. I'll leave that for the geologist. Weather is very interesting because we're up high, we have cold nights, uh, even during the summer, but we're close, close to the Pacific Ocean, which has a moderating influence. It's a fairly warm body of water. So you'll see uh, throughout the year, the temperatures don't vary that much uh, here at Lake Tahoe. Part of that is the moderating effect of the lake itself, its ability to store and release heat slowly. That's why if you watch the temperatures around here in the wintertime, you see Lake Tahoe maybe drops down to 20, it'll be five degrees in Trekkie. They don't have the, the lake to moderate their, their temperatures like we do. One of the beautiful things about Lake Tahoe and what makes it so popular is that for most of the year, you're, you're in what's called the outdoor comfort range where you can get by with basically uh, normal winter clothes like you'd wear for skiing or dress like me, t-shirt, shorts, and you're pretty comfortable. So this is the range right here, basically between 50 and 90 degrees. Uh, and you can see for a good part, particularly in the day, Lake Tahoe reaches that outdoor comfort range. And for any of you that have grown up in the upper Midwest or in the East, you know how cold cold can be. And we don't get cold here, so you know that. Uh, the summers are very dry and the winters are very wet. Between uh, November and April, basically between Thanksgiving and, and Easter, if it comes late, that's when we get 85% of our moisture, mostly of snow. But by May 1st, uh, the, the chance of getting more than a tenth of an inch of precipitation drops below 10%, and that kind of holds until mid-October, and then things start to pick up again. So that's why... Uh, Water engineers start the water year in October. And they, they, when you hear water forecasts and things like that, they're talking about the water year, which is, begins in October. That's what we do in California, because that's when we get our water. We don't start it in July 1st. Uh, Weather Bureau people start their water years July 1st, so you have to be real careful when you're looking at the data. Well, how much snow falls in the winter? Uh, measured in Tahoe City in, a, in a, just a typical winter, uh, we will get somewhere around 16 feet of total snowfall. Now, that doesn't mean it piles up to 16 feet deep, but it settles afterward to about 2.8 to 3 feet in a normal year. Um, so that's about what we get. And that's the longest one, the longest running uh, weather stations is at Tahoe City, where they measure snow depth, temperature, humidity, and all that. Obviously, if you live higher on the mountain, you're going to get more snow. If you live farther east, you're going to get less snow. So people here in Incline get a dusting of snow, whereas the same storm where I live on the west shore near Homewood drops a foot on my house. So those are the kind of differences you see here. So it all depends on uh, where you live. Now, another question is why is Lake Tahoe so clear? I kind of reasoned this out myself, uh, partly based on scientific research and, and just my own judgment, but you have to remember that the, the size of the lake surface itself is relatively small compared to the watershed. And this is pretty unusual in nature, that you have a, a lake surface that is only a third uh, or less the size, half the size uh, of the watershed. Usually a lake surface is a, a, a percentage, a small percentage of the total watershed. And so this is unusual. Crater Lake is the same thing. It has almost no watershed. And so that meant there was very little opportunity for natural pollutants to get into Lake Tahoe over this 10 to 20 million years. 
before humans began occupying the lake. Another reason is just the immense volume of water that is in the lake. So you have a, a small amount of pollutants, naturally caused pollutants coming into the lake to begin with. When Lake Tahoe was in its natural condition, it was surrounded by stream zones and a band of vegetation around most parts of the lake on the shoreline. And this further filtered out any of the natural pollution that might have gotten off the watershed and into the streams. Then it got trapped in these stream environment zones or, or swamps or meadows or whatever and was, uh, and was uh, removed from being uh, having an effect on the lake. So we have two things here, just a small amount of natural pollution coming in and then a huge volume of water to dilute it out. And that accounts, I think, for about two-thirds of the reason why Lake Tahoe is so pure. And then my theory is that the, the third reason it's so pure is because it's so deep. And that kind of tracks with some of the research I've seen more recently, that deeper lakes tend to be more pure. And I think that's because once that rare little bit of pollution sediment particle gets into that lake, it eventually settles down so deep that under most normal conditions, it's never resurrected again. Whereas if you've got a more shallow lake that's 20 or 30 feet deep, winds can stir up the bottom and resuspend the material. Uh, this lake does mix, and from t every few years, you will get bottom water brought to the surface. But I don't think the mixing is so severe that it stirs up the bottom sediments. In fact, actually, the sediments are kind of sealed off once they get down there. So those are my three reasons, three or four reasons, why I think Lake Tahoe is so pure. Uh, the thing that Tahoe is known for is its clarity, obviously. Purity leads to clarity. Clarity and purity go hand in hand, of course. Um, and um, low amounts of nitrogen and phosphorus and low amounts of particles and sediment in the lake uh, leads to more clear water. And so this has been the trend uh, based on work by Dr. Goldman. Uh, lake Tahoe, as you know, has lost some of its clarity. At one point, it had lost about 40 feet but I think it's, it's now leveling out, and I think I'll leave the question to the scientists in the back of the room to answer whether they think this is a long-term trend or if we're just seeing a, a short-term effect here. But I think everybody agrees, for whatever reason, the loss of clarity seems to be slowing down anyway compared to the one foot a year that we were seeing during the 1970s and 1980s when we had a lot of growth underway. This is how clarity, uh, of Tahoe compares with other lakes in the region and in the world. Uh, again, these are all deep lakes, again, so you got that, that commonality of having uh, a lot of depth in these, in these very clear lakes. Now, I show Lake Tahoe as being somewhere around 75 feet, which is about its most recent average clarity, but I think it was, in history, much more clear prior to the logging and and the development. There were not any good clarity measurements made prior to Dr. Goldman in the late 60s. When he, when he started measuring it, the clarity was a little over 100 feet. But similar lakes with similar watershed characteristics and similar water quality have higher clarity, meaning you can see the white disk, which you'll learn about um, farther down in the water. So Tahoe maybe has lost more clarity than we're willing to admit. And all we, but scientifically, all we can really go with is what was measured at the time that Dr. Goldman was there, um, which is basically over a, a little over 100 feet. So I started off quoting Mark Twain, and I'll, I'll do it again, as he ambled up over the mountains from, from Carson City, and he came down, and those of you who know the local area know this is Tunnel Creek, and he came down the road on, on Tunnel Creek to find a, a skiff that had been left for him at Hidden Beach, but when he popped out of the forest, he recalled 10 years later and wrote down in Roughing It, we plodded on, and suddenly the lake burst upon us, a noble sheet of blue water raised 6,300 feet above the level of the sea, and towering over another 2,000 feet yet our mountains. As I stood there looking at the snow-capped mountains, photographed on its still surface, I thought it must surely be 
the fairest picture the whole earth affords. And that's where the term fairest picture comes from, from Mark Twain. So with that, I'll wrap up. I think I've got four minutes for questions.